So before we go further, let's invite the Lord's presence. Father in heaven, this is now where we put the entire presentation together. Father, I pray once again that I may speak the words that you would have me speak. Please let your angels and your Holy Spirit be here. We're dealing in such delicate subjects, such important subjects, Father. Subjects that we cannot just accept on the word of somebody preaching it. Everyone listening should be able to go back and research it and see if these things that I'm saying is just a figment of my imagination or if these things are really so. Bless us, I pray, Father, as we continue to study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. In the time when his wrath shall go forth in judgments, these humble, devoted followers of Christ are powerless to stop the rushing torrent of iniquity, and hence they are filled with grief and alarm. They mourn before God to see religion despised in the very homes of those who have had great light. They lament and afflict their souls because pride, avarice, selfishness, and deception of almost every kind are in the church. The Spirit of God which prompts to reproof is trampled underfoot while the servants of Satan triumph. God is dishonored, the truth made of none effect. The Lord commissions his messengers, the men with slaughtering weapons in their hands, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house, Ezekiel 9, 1 to 6. Here we see that the church, the Lord's sanctuary, was the first to feel the stroke of the wrath of God. The ancient men, those to whom God had given great light and who had stood as guardians of the spiritual interest of the people, had betrayed their trust. These dumb dogs that would not bark are the ones who feel the just vengeance of an offended God. Those who had been regarded as worthy and righteous proved to be ringleaders in apostasy. It is with reluctance that the Lord withdraw His presence from those who have been blessed with great light and who have felt the power of the world in ministering to others. They were once His faithful servants, favored with His presence and guidance. But they departed from him and led others into error, and therefore are brought under the divine displeasure. Testimonies for the Church, the Seal of God, Volume 5, page 210. Study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These words will be literally fulfilled. Yet the time is passing and the people are asleep. Manuscript Releases, Volume 1, page 260. Look at this quote. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The Spirit and power of God will be poured out upon His children. Great Controversy, page 464. Revelation 18 speaks of another angel that comes down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with His glory. What causes this revival of primitive godliness? You know, before we read this quote, I want to share something with you. We have been waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We think it's going to be some great phenomena that's going to take place. And we don't realize what the scripture teaches regarding this. Notice this quote. The prophecies in the 18th of Revelation will soon be fulfilled. During the proclamation of the third angel's message, another angel is to come down from heaven having great power, and the earth is to be lighted with his glory. During the loud cry in the future, the light of present truth will be seen flashing everywhere. The word declares, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And she quotes Ezekiel 36. She then says, this is the descent of the Holy Spirit, sent from God to do its office work. As men, women, and children proclaim the gospel, the Lord will open the eyes of the blind to see his statutes and will write upon the hearts of the truly penitent his law. 
the closing work, Review on Herald, October 13, 1904. Right before the second coming of Christ, people are going to have their eyes open. They are going to see the statutes of God. It's going to bring a revival of primitive godliness. I can tell you that for 30 years I have been preaching this message and it's been an uphill battle. And now all of a sudden, people from 47 countries are telling me, wow, I can't believe we've never seen this before. Something is happening, my friends. I believe we're seeing drops of the latter rain fall and we are not paying attention to it. Many have in a great measure failed to receive the former rain. They have not obtained all the benefits that God has thus provided for them. They expect that the lack will be supplied by the latter rain. When the richest abundance of grace shall be bestowed, they intend to open their hearts to receive it. They are making a terrible mistake. The work that God has begun in the human heart in giving His light and knowledge must be continually going forward. Every individual must realize his own necessity. The heart must be emptied of every defilement and cleansed for the indwelling of the Spirit. It was by the confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God, that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The same work only in greater degree must be done now. Only those who are living to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. Testimonies to Ministers 507 and 508. You know what? Unless we live up to the light we have, God cannot give us more light. We are wicked, we are disobedient, and God says to us, you cannot commit adultery. Wow, Lord, I had not seen that. And we stopped committing adultery. Then he says, you cannot take my name in vain. And we stopped taking his name in vain. Then he says, you shall not be cursing. And we stop cursing. Then he says, you shall not lie. You shall not take your neighbor's wife. And little by little, we are cleansed. But if we don't obey the light that we have, why is God going to give us greater light? The Holy Spirit, look at the last line, it may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. And this is why today some people say, wow, I can't get enough. I'm studying as much as I can, and I can't get enough of the Bible. And others say, no, nah, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. This is what's going on right now. In the night season, I was in my dreams in a large meeting with ministers, their wives, and their children. We've read this, but I want to give it to you again. Through the prophets, God has given a delineation of what will come to pass in the last days of this earth's history, and the Jewish economy is full of instruction for us. All these things were closely studied by the company before me in my dream. Scripture was compared with Scripture, and application was made of the Word of God to our own time. I submit to you that it is impossible to understand the delineation of events which will soon take place under the seven thunders of Revelation 10 and the three prophetic periods of Daniel 12 unless we understand God's statutes which form part of the Jewish economy. The Jewish economy revolves around the Jubilee year, which is the climax of seven sabbatical cycles, each one ending on a sabbatical year. The sabbatical year, look at the quote, is also known as the acceptable year of the Lord, Isaiah 61.2. The year of release, Deuteronomy 31.10. The year of my redeemed, Isaiah 63.4. And the year of recompenses, Isaiah 34.8. It is a biblical principle that God's people will be delivered at the end of a sabbatical year, and the sabbatical year always commences and ends on the Day of Atonement. If it doesn't happen in 2022, we got to go to 2029. Do you really believe that the, the condition the world is in today, when Russia is broke, China is having serious financial difficulties, just their bonds were just degraded not too long ago, 
Japan is broke. The United States, we're in debt up to our ears. We're broke. We just, we're just the biggest and the baddest and we can get away with it. And we see the, the situation in the church and we see the moral declension in the world. Friends, Jesus is coming. This is the biggest event in the history of the world. And people are going to take note of it and it's going to be proclaimed throughout the world. So look at this quote. At the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, Deuteronomy 31.10, the first one was Deuteronomy 15.1. A third quote, At the end of seven years, let ye go every man his brother, a Hebrew, Jeremiah 34.14. God's people are delivered at the end of a sabbatical year. No doubt about it. This is a little booklet that I offered in my 6,000 year study. I'm offering it to you again. If you have not seen it, if you have not read it, this will explain the God's feast, the sabbatical year, the jubilee year, how to keep them, when they take place, etc. All you have to do is drop me an email there, lou at sundaylawalert.com. Look at some of the quotes here though. Look at quote number two on the right. These statutes were explicitly given to guard the Ten Commandments. They were to be binding upon men in every age as long as time should last. Review and Herald, May 6, 1875. Look at the next one. In seeking to cast contempt upon the divine statutes, Satan has perverted the doctrine of the Bible and errors have been incorporated into the faith of thousands who profess to believe the scriptures. The last great conflict between truth and error is but a final struggle of the long-standing controversy concerning the law of God. God's statutes are part of God's law. Upon this battle we are now entering, a battle between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah, between the religion of the Bible and the religion of fable and tradition. Great Controversy 582. Look at the next one, the teaching which has become so widespread that the divine statutes are no longer binding upon men is the same as idolatry in its effect upon the morals of the people. What are we going to do with that? Patriots and Prophets 143. The last one, the sacred statutes which Satan has hated and sought to destroy will be honored throughout a sinless universe. Patriots and Prophets, page 342. Don't forget that the entire universe is looking down upon earth right now. They are going to remember, we're going to go from world to world, Ellen White says, teaching people what sin was like, what it did to us, the curse that it is, etc. I believe this is why these statues are going to be remembered for a sinless universe. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Men of talent and pleasing address who once rejoiced in the truth employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. Do the trumpets of Revelation 8 sound before or after the close of probation? Important study here. There has been a, a large well-financed movement in our church for the last 30 years advising us that we have time to prepare since probation cannot close until the first four trumpets of Revelation 8 sound. Will a big bang warn a disobedient world before the close of probation? Was there a big bang before the flood commenced? Was there a big bang before fire rained down upon Sodom and Gomorrah? Was there a big bang before the judgment of the dead commenced on October 22, 1844? And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. Mark 8, 12. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. 
and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saint ascended before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. Notice, the angels prepare themselves to sound. In other words, the trumpets have not sounded. And already the angel that is holding that golden censer, which is in the, most, in the holy place, not in the most holy place. Remember, the golden censer is kept on, on, on top of the golden altar, which is in the holy place in front of the veil that goes into the most holy place. So the angel that's standing by that golden altar, which is Jesus Christ, we're going to find out, has already left the most holy place, has a censer in his hand. Angels come by and say, our work is finished. God's people are sealed. He takes the censer, throws it to the ground, and then the angels prepare themselves to sound. Very clear from this passage alone from Revelation 8 that this takes place after the close of probation because we know that when, the, when Jesus leaves the most holy place, probation closes. We're going to see this now. I'm just giving you a, an overview of it. But notice that it says, And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. That altar is in the most holy place. It is not in the, I'm, I'm sorry, it's in the holy place, not in the most holy place. Okay. Here is the most holy place, the holy place and the court. You see that in the, holy, in the most holy place, you've got the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, you've got the, and then you've got in the holy place, the golden altar. And that's where the golden censer is. There is the veil separating the two. Okay. Revelation 8, 5 states, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth. There is no altar in the most holy place. Therefore, this activity must take place in the holy place. In the typical day of atonement, after the high priest had finished his ministration in the most holy place, on the way out of the sanctuary, he was to stop at the altar that is before the Lord in the holy place and make an atonement for it. Leviticus 16:18. Look at this quote now from early writings. As Jesus moved out of the most holy place, a cloud of darkness covered the inhabitants of the earth. There was then no mediator between guilty man and an offended God. It was impossible for the plagues to be poured out while Jesus officiated in the sanctuary. But as his work there is finished and his intercession closes, there is nothing to stay the wrath of God and it breaks with fury upon the shelterless head of the guilty sinner. Jesus tarried a moment in the outer apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, and the sins which had been confessed while he was in the most holy place were placed upon Satan, the originator of sin, who must suffer their punishment. Early writings, pages 280 and 281. Where it says there, Jesus tarried a moment in the outer apartment of the heavenly sanctuary, that is where Revelation 8 takes place, where an angel comes and says, God's people are sealed. He takes the censer and throws it down. We're going to see that. I'm not asking you to take my word for it. Look at here. Revelation 8, 6 states, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Notice that the angels with the trumpets in Revelation 8 only warned the inhabitants of the earth that something is about to take place. They do not cause the destruction. Whereas the angels in Revelation 16 obey God's voice from the temple and pour out the plagues upon the earth, causing the destruction. Solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded, vial after vial poured out, one after another upon the inhabitants of the earth. Scenes of stupendous interest are right upon us. I was written in 1890 by Ellen White, Seventh-day Adventist, Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 982. So these trumpets are going to be loud trumpets. When you go to Exodus 19, the Lord has said to Moses, bring the people here and they, so they can gather around and they can hear the Ten Commandments. And it says there was a trumpet that sounded very loud and there was lightning and thunder and the people said, no, Moses, don't speak to us. We cannot handle this. You, you speak to God and then you speak to us. We, don't, we do not want God to speak to us. 
when they sounded the trumpets around Jericho, the same thing. It was a loud trumpet. Seven days they went around Jericho. When 1 Thessalonians 4 says, and the trumpet of the Lord will sound, and the dead in rise shall, rise shall rise first, it will be a loud trumpet. These trumpets are going to be a warning, I think personally, to God's people, advising them probation has now closed. You know that probation closes when before the, before the trumpet sound. So probation has now closed. If people come to you asking you for, for wisdom or for let us study the Bible, we now want to study, it's too late. Probation has closed. That's personally what I see. It's a warning to the inhabitants and to the wicked. Look at this quote, Revelation 8, 7 and 8. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees was burnt up. That's important. And all the green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, the second trumpet. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. So in the first two trumpets, the trees are burnt up and the sea became blood. <clears throat> Very important. Look at now Revelation 7. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God and saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So since Revelation 8 hurts the earth and the sea, then we know that the sealing takes place before Revelation 8, correct? Just like it's Revelation 7 for the sealing and Revelation 8 for the trumpets. Look, what, look at the third uh, paragraph there. If the sealing takes place before the close of probation, then it follows that trumpets 1 and 2 sound after the close of probation, since they heard the trees and the seas. The living righteous will receive the seal of God prior to the close of probation. Maranatha, page 211. An angel returning from the earth announces that his work is done. The final test has been brought upon the world, and all who have proved themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. Then... Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. Great Controversy, page 613. And you're going to see that very clearly now in Great Controversy. So in other words, after the angel comes and tells Jesus, our work is done, people, God's people have been sealed, then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above, in the most holy place, and comes out of the most holy place. Notice now. I saw angels herring to and fro in heaven. An angel with a writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth and reported to Jesus that his work was done and the saints were numbered and sealed. Then I saw Jesus who had been, had been in the most holy place, who had been ministering before the ark containing the Ten Commandments, throw down the censer. Jesus had moved out of the most holy place into the golden altar where the golden censer is kept and he throws the golden censer from that altar. Continuing. He raised his hands and with a loud voice said, It is done. And all the angelic hosts laid off their crowns as Jesus made the solemn declaration, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Early writings, pages 279 and 280. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire off the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. So the censer is cast down before the angels sound the first trumpet. There's only one censer cast down in the spirit of prophecy, and only one censer cast down in the entire Bible, and it is right here. You know, my friends, we do not have to preach the Bible. We do not have to give Bible studies. Some of us aren't able to do that. I know when I first started working for the Lord, I couldn't do that. It takes a long time to be able to do that. But we can all hand out a book. And of all the books Mrs. White wrote, of all her 55 books, in 70 years of ministry, she said the great controversy was the most important book. I carry this book in my truck. I give it to people when I put gas. I give it to people when I go into a store and the Lord says, wow, that was a nice man. And I walk back and give it, uh, pick up a book and go back into the store and give him a book. 
And let me tell you my pitch. It's a simple three minute pitch. I didn't used to do it before, but now we're so close to the end of the world that I feel that, that people won't forget to read the book. And I'm gonna give you my pitch. Example, last, a few weeks ago, I had a gentleman that came to fix my garage door at home. He fixed my door and I said, man, that's a great job. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it. By the way, do you like to read? Oh, I love to read. Let me give you a book. So I came back with the book, I opened the book that I gave him and I said, look, this book was written 130 years ago. It has the first three quarters, history that we've never seen before, history from the Dark Ages, that's why it's called the Dark Ages, and the last quarter is based on the book of, the, of uh, Daniel and Revelation, the most powerful book, the most interesting book I have ever read. I know you're busy, I know you're working from sun up till sundown. I don't expect you to read this book now, but I want to give you the pitch, the final punch line of this book, so that when you see it come to pass, which I don't think is going to be long from now, you will remember this book and you will pick it up and read it. And this is what's going to happen. We're going to have natural disasters of unprecedented magnitude. We're going to have wars very soon now. Uh, wars that will really cause us to say, like Matthew, in the book of Matthew, it says wars and rumors of wars. Right now, we're not really worried about wars because we're the biggest country in the world and we're the superpower, right? But we're going to have natural disasters of unprecedented magnitude and frequency. We're seeing it. And when I say this, people are already shaking their heads saying, oh yeah, I, I feel that. We're going to have earthquakes, we're going to have volcanoes, we're going to have all these things happening. And all of a sudden, somebody's going to get up and say, the reason why these horrible things are happening in the earth, climate change, you, you hear all the issues about climate change. The reason is because we've taken God out of our schools, out of our homes, out of our government places, and people again shake their head. And the solution is going to be, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but the solution is going to be to enact a national Sunday law in America, forcing people to worship on Sunday. There's only two problems with that. First of all, God doesn't force anybody to do anything. God presents the truth. If you want to obey it, you obey it. If not, it's your problem. Secondly, when you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, never do you see that Sunday is the day to worship God. Sunday is not the seventh day of the week. Sunday is not the Sabbath of the Lord mentioned in Ezekiel 20 verse 12 or 20 verse 20. So I give you this book. I pray that when the time comes that you see these things, the Holy Spirit will remind you of these things. And I promise you, when you get to heaven, you're going to look me up and thank me for giving you this book. That's my pitch. That's it. Simple. And, and, and you know what? That person may be a lady that her husband at home does not allow her to go to church, has her totally controlled, but she can take that book and read it at work and be saved. We don't have to preach. We don't have to give Bible studies. That's what we do. This is a quote from The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy should be very widely circulated. It contains the story of the past, the present, and the future. In its outline of the closing scenes of this earth's history, it bears a powerful testimony in behalf of the truth. I am more anxious to see a wide circulation for this book than for any of the others I have written. For in The Great Controversy, the last message of warning to the world is given more distinctly than in any of my other books. While writing the manuscript of the great controversy, I was often conscious of the presence of the angels of God. And many times the scenes about which I was writing were presented to me anew in visions of the night, so that they were fresh and vivid in my mind. The results of the circulation of the great controversy are not to be judged by what now appears. By reading it, some souls will be aroused and will, take, will have courage to unite themselves at once with those who keep the commandments of God. But a much larger number who read it will not take their position until they see the very events taking place that are foretold in it. The fulfillment of some of the predictions will inspire faith that others also will come to pass. And when the earth is lightened with the glory of the Lord in the closing work, 
many souls will take their position on the commandments of God as a result of this agency. Cole Porter Ministry, pages 127 to 129. If you have not read The Great Controversy in the last three years, or if you have never read it at all, stop what you're doing, set aside a time where you read 10 minutes of that book, 15 minutes every day, and you will put that book away in two or three months. It will show you how to prepare for what is soon coming. You will find the last 17 chapters from chapter 25 on, you will find it more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. The only problem is that you need chapters 1 to 25 to explain 25 and on. But it's history, mostly history that we've, we've never taken in school. This is the great controversy if you want a good paperback version or if you want the hardback, where you can get it from. Make sure that it's the 1911 edition with the introduction by Ellen White. There are books that have taken the introduction out um, and those, this is where you can get it from. You also have the Conflict of the Ages series, a tremendous volume of books. This is called Five Books. Patriots and Prophets is from Adam to the Patriarchs. Prophets and Kings, all of the kings in the Old Testament. The Desire of Ages, the, be the best book written on the life of Jesus. Then you've got Acts of the Apostles, Peter, Paul, all the Apostolic Church. And then you have the Great Controversy as the final book in that. And if you read those five books, you will know more Bible than 99% of the people, including pastors that are alive today. Read one and you'll see and ask yourself, is this inspired by God or not inspired? I invite you to do that. This is the book that I give out, uh, America in Prophecy. Uh, you can order it for $44 a box, 40 copies, a little over a dollar. Uh, paperback, great little book. You can order it and, and, and we should have them at home. We should have them because this book will become very, very valuable in the times that are coming. The problem is that we don't have money to pass out these books. This is, this is the, the, the issue that we have. But this is where the money comes from right here. The, look at this quote. To promote the assembling of the people for religious service, as well as to provide for the poor, a second tithe of all the increase was required. Concerning the first tithe, the Lord had declared, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel. Numbers 18.21. But in regard to the second, he commanded, Thou shalt live before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and of the firstling of thy herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Deuteronomy 14.23, etc. This tithe, or its equivalent in money, they were for two years to bring to the place where the sanctuary was established. After presenting a thank offering to God and a specified portion to the priest, the offerers were to use the remainder for a religious feast. This is how they had money to go to the feast. It was a big ordeal at that time. You had to travel sometimes as much as two or three weeks to get to the feast in Jerusalem, in which the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow should participate. Thus, provision was made for the thank offerings and feasts at the yearly festivals and the people were drawn to the society of the priests and Levites that they might receive instruction and encouragement in the service of God. Every third year, however, this second tithe was to be used at home in entertaining the Levite and the poor, as Moses said, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled, Deuteronomy 26, 12. This tithe would provide a fund for the uses of charity and hospitality. Then, as now, persons were subject to misfortune, sickness, and loss of property. Yet, so long as they followed the instruction given by God, there were no beggars among them, neither any who suffered for food. Patriots and Prophets, pages 530-531. Friends, I want you to know that for 30 years, or 35 years now, I have practiced this double tithing. And God has blessed, always has blessed. I invite you to try that. You know, I have a, a fund, that second tithe sits in a fund. And if a sister says, oh, brother, my car broke down, I don't have money. I can call two or three people that, that practice the same thing. And they come and they say, hey, I'll give you 500. Hey, I'll give you 1,000. You can buy, a, you can buy a, a motor for somebody. You can buy books to distribute. I have no problem. 
buying books and passing them out with God's money. This is God's money. The world is coming to an end. We've got to warn people. Try it and you'll see that God blesses you. Now I want to share with you a 90-day look ahead. Event number two, Matthew 24, 6 and 7. This comes from my presentation, 6,000 years and in the year 2022. Part two, event number one, slides 141 to 249. This is an entire part two, 100 plus slides on Daniel 8. Look what it says. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. According to Daniel's 2,500-year-old prophecy of the ram and the he-goat in Daniel 8, what happened to Iraq in 2003 is about to happen to Iran, Iraq, and Syria. The angel Gabriel declared that this battle takes place in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. This battle will commence the last moments of this earth's history. Daniel 8 and Daniel 7 it says very clearly the battle between the ram and the he goat. So this is what I see happening any time now. We're going to do to Iran, Iraq, and Syria, or we did to Iraq in 2003. Second event that's going to take place. Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. We will have natural disasters of unprecedented frequency and magnitude. And this will drive the rest of the agenda below. That is from slides 29 and 250 to 253 in my 6,000 year presentation. Look at uh, Earth Day. <clears throat> this is coming up right now, April 22nd, 2019. You see all of the issues being made of green, let's go green. Uh, the representatives from Congress saying that we have to protect the Earth. The Pope is very big into this. April 22nd of this year, which is at the, in the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, has been declared Earth Day. Don't know if anything is going to happen there, but it's a perfect opportunity for the Pope to say something again in reference to Sunday, because he, he has said plenty before, not only him, but all the other Popes before him. You can find all of those quotes in my 6,000 year study. Look at Pope Francis' encyclical letter, Laudato Si, published June 18th, 2015, paragraph 71 and 237. They're, they are in my 2000, in my 6,000-year uh, study. He talks about the Sabbath, how it's been changed to Sunday. He talks about the sabbatical year. He talks about the Jubilee year. He says that we should have laws protecting people today that want to keep Sunday. You need to go there and check that out. Another thing that is going to happen, event number 10, Matthew 24, 23 to 27. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. On slides 649 through 660, Event number 10 in my 6,000 year presentation, I have a study on, are the dead really dead? Look at that quote. Through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. Great Controversy, page 588. Why do you think we're having so many movies today on the dead? on out-of-body experiences, on beings invading aliens from other, other worlds, etc. God is preparing and Satan is preparing for the tremendous conflict that is coming. Satan himself will appear on the earth. We're going to read that in a moment. The apostles of Christ will appear. And if you don't know that when you die, you rest until Jesus comes. That's also in that study. You're going to be deceived. This is slide 652 in the 6,000 year study. Notice the first book on the what happens when you die. The Fox sisters from New York played an important role in the creation of spiritualism. We are told that spiritualism is going to be one of the main avenues through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul 
In other words, you don't die. The moment you die, you go to heaven. Does it make sense that the moment you die, you go to heaven? You know, so many people have been so, so turned off by that. On his deathbed, my dad was so relieved to know that when you die, you don't burn in hell for millions and millions of years. Does it make sense that a God of love would burn somebody in hell for millions and millions of years when they've only lived here 70 years and sinned for 70 years? Does not make sense. And I said to him, Dad, what if mom is in heaven and all of a sudden the, th the son that she left here, whom she thought was such a good son, all of a sudden I get into drugs and I kill people and I become a gang member, etc. Could she really be happy in heaven? And you know, when I explained that to my dad, he said, wow, I had never imagined the reason why I wasn't a super faithful Catholic is because I was... I never could love a God that would burn me for millions and millions of years. This is why these things are, all these books on spiritualism, look at all these books on this, on this slide here. This is on slide 657. This is the first book I read as a Catholic, and it will shock you, this story. I covered in uh, the 6,000 year presentation, but I'm gonna give you a, a real, a little glimpse of it now. This took place, this is a, a, a book called The Woman Closed with the Sun, Eight Great Operations of Our Lady. This, the Last Secret of Fatima. I decided to read Fatima. In the eight, I decided I'm gonna read Fatima. Let me tell you the story. A lot of people don't know it. 1917, Three little boys are walking through the forest and they see a beautiful lady on top of a tree. And the lady says, I am the Virgin Mary. And they went back and told their mom and the mom said, don't listen to that, that must be a demon talking to you. But it happened again and they went to their pastor and the pastor said the same thing, the priest said the same thing. And then the lady kept on appearing to the, to the three little children all the time. And of course, nobody believed them. So one day the Virgin Mary, supposedly the Virgin Mary, because we know that when we die, we rest in the grave. This whole study is in my 6,000 year study. We rest in the grave and Jesus says, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I'm, I am, you may be there also. He is preparing mansions in heaven and he's coming back for a second time to take those that have loved him back to heaven with him. The rest of the dead that have not loved him will remain dead until after the thousand years. All of that is in my 6,000 year presentation. But let me tell you what happened. The Virgin Mary tells his three children, go through town and tell them that on such and such a day, I think it was September 10th, I think, I, I'm not sure, I am going to appear to all the people. So people came from everywhere, sick on stretchers and on, and on they were just taking 70,000 people on top of a mountain waiting for the Virgin Mary. First day comes, nothing happens. Second day comes, nothing happens. Third day comes, nothing happens. They were ready to lynch the children because they had cost them all to go up there with their sick on wheelchairs, etc. All of a sudden, it starts pouring down rain. All the sick get drenched, all the blankets get drenched. Imagine 70,000 people, that's a whole stadium on top of a mountain. And when they're about to take and put their hands on the children, all of a sudden from way up there in the sky, the Virgin Mary is coming. She looks at them and she says, you did not believe that I was a Virgin Mary. Let me show you what I am going to do. She takes her finger, she goes like this to the sun, the sun starts coming down and they start saying, Oh, Virgin Mary, lady, no, please don't do it. Don't destroy us. She moves her finger back and the sun goes back into the sky. 70,000 people saw that. She then takes her hand and breaks the earth. The earth opens up and she sees the people that have been burning in hell for, for a thousand years. And they're saying, Oh, listen to the Virgin Mary. Pray to the Virgin Mary. I, as a Catholic, am thinking, how can we pray to the Virgin Mary when the Bible says we can only pray to one God, the mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. And this is the book that opened my eyes to the fact that, wow, something is, something is wrong here. 
I submit to you that a lot of things are going to happen very soon that are going to bring us to a tremendous test. We're going to see miracles happen between our, before our eyes, just like it happened in Fatima. And this is why you go to some of these places and you try to tell people that was, not, that was nothing but a, but, a, but a figment of their imagination and they think you're crazy. They saw it. They felt it. They heard it. They saw all of that. The devil has power to make miracles, and this is what's going to happen very soon. You know that the Pope is a very big believer in the Virgin Mary. I do not doubt it at all that the Virgin Mary is going to be used in a mighty way by the enemy when the poor sister is lying in the ground waiting for Jesus to come. Look at this uh, quote. I'll let you read it on your own, but you're going you're gonna to find out a little bit more about the, about the story of Fatima and the secrets of Fatima, which have been around since 1917. Matthew 24, 23 to 27. If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. I'm only going to read the yellow. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. When we see all these things happening, there are the spirits of devils working miracles. Revelation 16, 14. Let me tell you, right now, wherever you are, you have on your right hand an angel of God and on your left hand an angel of Satan. We all do. And when you're going to make a decision, the angel of God says, don't do that. It's not right. And the other angel says, sure, do it. Not a problem. Don't worry about it. And it's a battle. That you, you know what I'm talking about. It's a battle that we feel in our minds. A time is coming when the Sunday law is enacted. That same angel that has been talking to you is going to appear in the form of your mom, your dad, your granddad, your favorite grandmother. And they are going to speak, sound, and look identical to what it was like. And they are going to say, you do not believe that I am really your grandmother? Do you remember that day that you were telling me a secret that nobody else knew but just you and I? Your mom didn't know, your dad didn't know, only you and I, you shared it with me. Do you remember that? How does she know that? Because it's the same evil angel that's been with you since you were born. And they are going to say these things to us and completely confuse us and tell us, God has, in fact, changed Saturday to Sunday, and that's the day you're supposed to go to church. Second quote, transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world, and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is very near. We who know the truth should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Testimonies for the Church, volume 8, page 28. This is going to happen as an overwhelming surprise, friends. Look at this one. The apostles, Peter and Paul, which may be seven feet, seven and a half feet tall, for all we know, it was 2,000 years ago. You know that the race has been coming, getting weaker and weaker since the beginning of time, completely contrary to what the world says. The apostles, as personated by these lying spirits, are made to contradict what they wrote at the dictation of the Holy Spirit when on earth. They deny the divine origin of the Bible and thus tear away the foundation of the Christian's hope and put out the light that reveals the way to heaven. Great Controversy, page 557. Last quote. Wonderful scenes with which Satan will be closely connected will soon take place. God's word declares that Satan will work miracles. He will make people sick and then will suddenly remove from them his satanic power. They will then be regarded as healed. These works of apparent healing will bring Seventh-day Adventists to the test. Even us, who know the state of the dead, who knows these things, are going to say, wow, how can those things be happening in that church? How come people are being healed in that church? The counterfeit revival will take place in those churches before it takes place for God's people. Last day events, page 166. That is slide 660 in my 6,000 year presentation. And now look at this one. I think this is the last slide. Uh, pay, slide 446 from my 6,000 years. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, 
with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 through 11. What is this strong delusion? We've never been told that. I want to suggest to you what I think it is because notice that it says strong delusion. God has tried to work with us all along. A time is coming when he says these people will not hear anymore and he will, he will bring us strong delusion that we might believe a lie. Not because he doesn't want to love us, but because we have rejected him. Look at this quote. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, this is the top of everything, right? Satan himself will personate Christ. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness, resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. And she quotes Revelation 1, 13 to 15. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. This is why we're having all these movies, why all these extraterrestrials are coming, because we don't know how he's going to make his landing, but he will land on the earth and walk among the people and heal the people. And they're going to think this is Jesus Christ, and it's not. Listen. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him, while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. That's Great Controversy, page 624. And it is the same words as strong delusion in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 and 11. That is my opinion. Um, I think this is right upon us, my friends. I think this is what we can expect in the next 90 days. All we know for sure, we don't know when the National Sunday Law will be enacted, but we do know that if God chooses 2022 to be the, day, the year when he uh, delivers his people at the end of a sabbatical year, the 1260 days, the 42 months of revelation of persecution that is coming in the future is about to start right in this Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is right around the corner a week from now. May God bless you. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I only pray that people will not take my word for what I have shared, but that they may go back and study and find themselves approved. This is the only thing you have told us. Don't take anybody's word. Don't believe your mom. Don't believe your dad. Don't believe your pastor or your priest. We have to study for ourselves, Father. We are responsible for the light that we have received. Our mom maybe never heard about the Sabbath, and she will be in heaven if she was obedient to everything she knew. Father, help us to wake up. Help us to realize that we're out of time. Remind us that you've got a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Help us to set aside a time, beginning right now, Father, early in the morning to spend with you in prayer, in Bible study. Help us to have worship with our families, with our children. Fifteen minutes in the morning, half an hour at night. Help us to pick a book and read it with our wives. 
10 minutes a day, you can put away a 600-page book in two or three months. Father, you've given us so many tools not to be deceived, but yet you tell us, if possible, even the elect will be deceived by the miracles that will be performed. Bless us as we continue studying your word. Thank you for what you have done for each one of us. Thank you for Jesus, for dying in the cross for us, and for forgiving our sins. In Jesus' name, amen.